So he mounted what was then and maybe still, except for another IBM incident, one of the largest web chats in the world. They called it a values jam. And in 2003, all IBM employees, then over 350,000, were invited to join a three-day values jam or web chat discussing what should the IBM values be for the 21st century. Well, when he told his board that he was going to do this, there was a board member who was a retired CEO from an old industry company who said, but Sam, isn't this socialism? Which some countries in the world may consider a good model, but in the US, it's the biggest put down one can make of any effort or program at the moment. And he said, no, it's not. He said, it's what we have to do in the 21st century. Our people are educated. They're sophisticated. They're cynical. They talk to each other. We can't do this at corporate. We have to engage people in telling us what they think. Imagine that. In order to do that, by the way, to have this dialogue about values, they had to stretch their technology, which I'll come back to in a moment. They had to stretch their technology because at that time, the technology wasn't there to allow that many people to interact online um, over that period of time. I mean, if you, if you know how quickly certain sites crash at a relatively small number, just in the thousands of people, so they stretched their technology because they had a value, a sense that their purpose would be enriched by this dialogue about values. So it's not the words, it's the conversation. It's the permission to talk about values in the workplace on an everyday basis and let that guide decisions. Well, 140,000 people weighed in, and IBM emerged after a lot of boiling down of all that input with a set of three new values. And I'll say more about that in a moment. But it's not the words, it's the conversation, it's the permission, it's the logic. So when Procter & Gamble, that had been doing a lot of management to the PVP, was faced with a strategic choice about a commercial product that wasn't working but did improve lives. It was a water purification powder called Pure, which is actually miraculous. We could scoop up water from one of the polluted rivers, no longer polluted rivers, of this region or America, and in 20 minutes have clean drinking water, maybe tasting a little of chlorine. But they knew this product was good, but it was not a success in the marketplace in the developing countries that really needed clean water, because non-clean water is a huge health problem, but people didn't always know the connection. They didn't have the habit that we have with toothpaste and soap about using this powder every day at home to purify the water. In fact, many people liked the powder so much that they bought it but hoarded it for a special occasion. You know, as only your guests deserved clean water. So they were having trouble making a commercial success out of a product that had the potential to improve lives. And in many companies, that would have been enough to simply cut it off. But at Procter & Gamble, certain leaders, in fact, the chairman and the new CEO of the company were among the advocates of, we have the PVP, we must live up to our purpose and values. We will find a way to keep it alive. And so they did another very 21st century thing. They set up a not-for-profit to which they could give the product at cost and that not-for-profit was a partnership with major NGOs, UN agencies, the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, not-for-profits that were close to the community on the ground and therefore were a better means of distributing this than through stores. And that product figured into relief after the tsunami in Asia at the end of 2004, and by the way, I tell the story of IBM's response to the tsunami at, in the first chapter of my book, where companies with a sense of purpose mobilized in a humanitarian way, even when they had no commercial interest or stake, because it wasn't their people or their facilities who were hurt by these disasters. And pure, the water for purification powder was there 
to purify all the water supplies helped with the flood. P&G won awards for this later. It's called Children's Safe Drinking Water is the name of the nonprofit. But that isn't why they did it. That came later. They did it because they were trying to make strategic decisions in the business based on their purpose, and that's the first aspect of 21st century leadership that we desperately need. And the new CEO, Bob McDonald, who became CEO in July, is unashamed to talk values and purpose with financial analysts because he thinks that the values and purpose of the company are going to be their key strategic asset in the years to come for my second aspect of 21st century leadership, and that is innovation. We know how important innovation is to the success of any organization. It's finding something that does improve lives or improve the community or meet needs. That's always the basis for good, for good business propositions. It's always the basis for organizations to succeed in a crowded, cluttered world. They do something better that enhance users, new solutions. And that's a change, by the way, to be so oriented towards solutions. There was an IBM executive in the early 90s, a while ago now it seems, in the 20th century, as that company was moving to try to become a solutions company and not just a manufacturer, there was an IBM executive quoted way back then as saying, if customers don't like our solutions, they've got the wrong problems. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. So to be solutions oriented, to get innovation, 21st century leaders have to look beyond the walls of their building, the established products and services, how they've always done things, and they have to look outside, in fact, far outside, to the community to improve lives of people they may not yet have as customers, to know what the needs are that are emerging. They have to look at society. And so society is part of the stretch for these companies. Just as I said, IBM innovated, in their technology in order to be able to have an inclusive web chat. And in fact, a few years later, they set their innovation priorities as a company by another large web chat that 150,000 people participated in. Maybe a new meaning of organizational democracy. Certainly leaders who are willing to listen from people who are sitting in communities with customers in many places far beyond headquarters. And so that listening stretching to reach the community often leads to innovation. So I tell a story about a bank in India. I have a couple of good banks in the book, which is always heartening to people in banking who are beginning to feel like tobacco. You know, So I want to say that banking can really do good work. So a bank in India, ICICI Bank, a retail bank, once a government development bank, now a commercial retail bank, wanted to grow, and there's only so much growth in the urban areas. They couldn't put up branches fast enough, so they worked on ATM machines. But then by looking at society and the needs of people, realized that a large population is visually impaired and therefore couldn't use the ATM machines easily. So they invented talking ATM machines. They innovated. Um, they then couldn't put up enough ATM machines fast enough to reach all the population, the huge population in India out in rural areas. China Mobile's doing something like this too in China. And so they thought maybe they, everybody has a cell phone now, even in poor rural areas. They thought maybe they could do banking through cell phones, mobile banking. So they came to the U.S. and Europe to see what the best and latest technology was for mobile banking and realize we don't do it here. They went to South Africa and learned from South Africa and became the innovators in mobile banking, looking far beyond, looking outside at society and having that trigger innovation. When IBM started reinventing education as a contribution in partnership,